I train machine learning models on minute bar data and use it to trade with real money. In this video, I'll reveal what the models look like, how I trained them, and how they performed. And while doing so, I'll explain some of the important data science concepts using plain language. Are you ready? Let's jump in. Let me first explain what a minute bar is. Stocks trade continuously while the markets are open. A minute bar summarizes the trading that occurs within each minute, such as the first and last transaction prices, as well as the average price during the minute. One advantage of using minute bars instead of daily bars is that we get much more data at the minute level than at the daily level. Whereas a year has around 250 trading days, it has about 100,000 trading minutes, and using more data points lead to more robust models. I got my minute bar data from a site called Polygon, and then I started experimenting with SPY, which is an ETF that tracks the US stock market. If you don't know what an ETF is, please read my free ebook on investing. The link is in the description of this video. Now, unlike with some of my other videos, I'm not going to show you my code in this video, because if I did that, this video would be over an hour long. And for the same reason, I'm not going to explain my data processing steps either, even though that's very, very important. I'm going to leave that for future videos. I trained three different families of models, the standalone convolutional neural nets, the standalone LSTMs, and the models that combine convolutional neural nets and LSTMs. The standalone families are exactly the same as I've used in my other videos, so I won't go through them here. If you'd like to go in depth on those models, please go ahead and watch those videos first. But in this video, I'll explain my thinking behind the new model that combines convolutional neural nets and LSTMs. Recall that convolutional neural nets look for prominent patterns in the data. For instance, if a stock goes down then up, that could indicate that stocks will continue to go up. But if the stock goes up then down, it could indicate the opposite. These are just hypothetical patterns. They may or may not work in the real world. The standalone convolutional model only cares about whether the pattern has showed up in the input data. It doesn't care about whether the pattern emerged more than once or how recently the pattern emerged. On the other hand, LSTMs look at this input sequentially and tries to model the investor states of mind, so they do care about the recency of data points. In the standalone LSTM model, we use the price changes as inputs. For this new model, however, I fed it the outputs of the convolutional model. By doing so, the models first detect the presence of patterns in recent prices, and then gauge how the sequence of those patterns affect investor states of mind. So that's how the models work. Let me now describe how I trained them. I divided the data into four parts, and I'll explain the purpose of each of these parts using the analogy of how humans learn. The first part is the training data, and it spanned from the beginning of 2021 to June 2022. This data is like the reading section of a textbook. This is the only data from which models can learn new information from. All other data parts are used to analyze the model. The second part that goes from July 2022 to June 2023 is the validation data. This part is like the practice set of questions at the end of a chapter. The training algorithm constantly quizzes the model using the validation data, and when it thinks it's learned enough, the training stops. The third part of the data goes from July 2023 to the end of 2023, and I'll call this the evaluation data. This part is like an exam. Unlike with the validation data, you only evaluate this model once using this data, and its purpose is to see how well the model performs with a unique set of hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are settings like how many patterns to detect and how much memory to give to LSTMs. You can think of models with different hyperparameters like students with different abilities. Some students are going to be more gifted than others. So the purpose of the evaluation data is to identify the gifted ones. The last part of the data, which I'll call the test data, spans from the beginning of January 2024 until the beginning of March. These are like the problems that students solve when they graduate and work in the real world. Models only ever get to see this data set once, and their performance should tell us whether they know something valuable or whether they just fluked their exams. There are many other decisions that go into training a model, but I'll talk about them in later videos. Let's now talk about how we assess the models. There are many metrics we can use to assess a given model, and perhaps the most common way is to use a statistical metric called R-squared. But as I've explained in one of my other videos, R squared can be misleading. Instead, I chose to implement a simple backtest to assess a model. Whenever the model's prediction was positive, it assumed it bought SPY. 
And whenever its prediction was negative, it assumed we held cash. I then said that the model with the highest returns are the best models. Here are the results of the standalone convolutional neural nets with the best set of hyperparameters. These are the results for the evaluation data set, i.e. the best exam results. As you can see, the average returns are tiny. The best model seems to have gained about 0.0005% per minute. But this tiny number is much larger than the buy and hold number, and when accumulated across a long time span, it becomes large. Here's the cumulative performance of the best performing model. As you can see, it outperformed the buy and hold by over 20% in just six months. If I can outperform the stock market by 20% every six months, I'd be rich like Warren Buffett. The standard deviation of returns, on the other hand, are still small, but 100 times larger than the average returns. This unfortunately means that the performance of the model is going to be very random over short periods of time. Notice also that the model standard deviation is lower than the buy and hold standard deviation, which means that the model produces less risk than buying and holding. This lower risk is inevitable because the algorithm frequently holds cash. Now the results I've shown you all pertain to the evaluation data, but how do they hold up in the test data, i.e. in the real world? Unfortunately, not as well. The average return is a lot worse. In fact, for the best model, the returns are negative at a time when buy and hold would have made money. Cumulatively, that means the best model would have underperformed the buy and hold strategy by about 10% in just two short months. Now granted, the next four best models did better, but the results don't exactly inspire confidence. As it is, this doesn't make me want to use the convolutional neural nets to trade. Let's now see how the standalone LSTM performed. Here are the results of the LSTM in the evaluation data set. The average returns of the best LSTM model is almost double that for the convolutional neural nets. Although that did come with slightly higher risk, LSTMs still look great on the exam part of the data. For the test data set, the models didn't perform as well for the evaluation data set, but the average return still beat the buy and hold with similar standard deviations as before. If we had traded using the best LSTM in the early parts of 2024, we would have outperformed buy and hold by about 8% cumulatively. The one concern I have, however, is that two of the other best five models underperformed buy and hold. This leaves open the chance that the good performance of the best model is a fluke. Nonetheless, the standalone LSTM's results are encouraging, and I'd be willing to try them with real money. Lastly, let's see how the convolutional LSTM did. First, for the evaluation data set, the average returns are higher than they were for standalone LSTMs. Although those returns came with slightly higher risks, for the test data set, the average returns are similar to what we saw with LSTMs, albeit with slightly higher risk again. Here's what the performance of the best model would have looked like in the test period. Although the overall performance is similar to that of the LSTM model, the paths that they took are different. This suggests that the models detect different signals from the data. So instead of choosing one family of models over another, I chose to use both LSTMs and convolutional LSTMs. Specifically, I took the five best LSTM models and the five best convolutional LSTM models and used the average of their predictions to guide my trades. So now that I've described how I get the trading signals, let's now talk about how the models perform with real money. To test my algorithm, I opened a Wealthsimple account. I chose Wealthsimple because it offers commission-free trading in Canada and being commission-free is very important. My models recommended the trade every two or three minutes, so even if a brokerage charged just one cent per trade, the total commissions would amount to a lot. The problem with Wealthsimple though is that they don't have an API as some other brokerages do. That means there's no official way to automatically trade using my models. But there is a workaround. I could have my computer pretend to be a human user, and that's what I did. I had the algorithm trade just one share of SPY for a week from the beginning of March 4th to the end of March 8th. That constituted almost 2,000 trading minutes. And here are the results. Whereas my algorithm lost $6.70 over the course of the week, buying and holding SPY would have lost just 31 cents. In percentage terms, that means I would have lost about 1.3%, whereas holding SPY would have lost less than 0.1%. So what went wrong? There are a few possible answers. One potential answer is that the model is predicting well, but there was a problem translating the predictions into trades. This could happen, for instance, because I can't trade at the prices that the model assumes I can. Fortunately, I can check that by seeing how the model thinks I should have performed. This is a backtest of the best convolutional LSTM during the week of March 4th. 
As you can see, the backtest results are similar to realized results. And other models showed similar underperformance, so I ruled out this possibility. Another possible answer for the underperformance is that the models just don't work. It's possible that the good results that we've seen are flukes, but I tend to think this is unlikely. I've trained LSTMs and convolutional LSTMs many times, and their best models almost always produce good results in the test dataset. Still, it is possible that the models, for whatever reason, won't work going forward. The last potential reason for the underperformance is that I've been unlucky. Recall that the standard deviations of returns are much larger than the average returns themselves, and this suggests that in the short term, results can be very random. Using the numbers from the best five convolutional LSTM models, after 2,000 minutes, the model should generate a performance of between minus 6% and plus 8%. So the result of minus 1.3% is actually well within the range of our expectations. The only way to know whether my algorithm can actually make money is to give it more time. How much time? A year at the very least, but it could be up to three years. In the coming months, I'll update you on how the algorithm performs and explain different aspects of my code such as data processing and trading considerations. If you don't want to miss out on those videos, make sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching and see you next time.